Uh, before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. And there was light. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, I praise God. I mean, that's what we're here to do. We're here to praise Jesus. Um, we're not here to talk about ourselves. We're not here to build ourselves up. Uh, Lord, uh, your name is to, is to be on our lips. And Lord, if we are talking about something as true as we may think it is, and we are excluding Jesus from the conversation, then all it is is a form devoid of any, of any power uh, that heaven has to offer. God, I want to lift up a very, very special prayer uh, for those who are being affected by Ebola right now. I can't imagine living in one of those countries right now or living in, in Dallas or even Ohio. I can't imagine standing next to somebody as they cough. If I lived in those areas, just the, the fear and trepidation and Lord, I pray for peace. God, I pray for your angels to be filtering through the streets. I pray for your churches to be flowing through the streets, Lord, to minister and help those in need. Father in heaven, the, the most important thing we can always do is pray. And so, Lord, I just pray that, you, that we are always praying for those around us, but also those that we hear about in other parts of the country and the world. But here we are right now. And Lord, I pray for what, uh, for what you want to tell us, for what you want to share with us. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. I'm actually going to turn off one of these lights because they're right in my eyes, if you don't mind. I shared a little bit about this last night. Um, but as Seventh-day Adventists, uh, in our name, Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, Seventh-day meaning that we believe that uh, we believe in the fourth commandment. We believe in the Bible Sabbath. We believe in the creation Sabbath. We believe it's a gift that was given not just to a specific uh, nation or nationality. We believe he gave it to Adam and Eve, the father and mother of all humanity. And so we believe it's a gift for humanity. And the, and the commandment itself says, for this is the a Sabbath day of the Lord. It's not a Sabbath day of any person or group. It's God's day. It's the Lord's day. And so in our name, Seventh-day Adventist, we hold this very important and true to us that it's not that we hold up this day above God, it's that we come to this day because God has set this day aside like a reservation in which we come together to meet with God and God ministers to His people and then we in turn go and we minister to others. We're Seventh-day Adventists. Adventist means coming. Now, there was a first advent in which Jesus Christ came, born of a virgin. And a lot of people remember this first advent come Christmas time with nativity scenes and church Christmas programs or school Christmas programs. But if that's the first advent. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we are proclaiming, proclaiming the second advent. And that Jesus Christ just didn't come one time, but he's going to come back to live in and bring us back to heaven for all time. And so for, as Seventh-day Adventists, these are two uh, fundamental beliefs that we have that we hold to. But what we're going to talk about today is something that distinguishes us as Seventh-day Adventists from a lot of mainstream Christ, uh, Christian denominations. As, as far, and not just Christian denominations, a lot of other belief systems as well. So while we may not have it in our name, it is something that distinguishes us. I shared this last night that a lot of different denominations are starting to have services on other days besides Sunday. And so they may have a Saturday night service, a Saturday service, they may have a Friday night service. And so the day is not as big a deal as it used to be because people are trying to fit church into their busy schedules. The one thing we hold to a Seventh-day Adventist is that God is not something to be fit into my schedule. God is somebody my schedule revolves around. My life revolves around. And so I don't say, God, I got time for you at 4 o'clock today. I say, God, you've made my schedule. But the, one of the biggest differences today is what we believe the Bible teaches about life after death. When you look at Hollywood, parents, when you let your children watch television, movies, whatever, they are going to get a concentrated dose of this topic. 
And they're going to put nice little wings on it. They're going to put nice little pixie dust on it. They're going to put nice little smiles and cute eyes and, and all kinds of pretty things to fluff it up. But this is, this is greater than we could far have ever imagined. And while we may say it's, it's just a cartoon, it's just a children's program. It is just a movie. We are being inundated with this. That when you die, that's when you live. Before we go any further, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I pray. Once again, we pray for truth. We are not saved by information. We are saved by grace. But the information you give us helps us, protects us, and keeps us from the clutches and grips of the devil. From the moment we're born, the devil reaches out for each one of us. But God, your arms reached out on the cross and throughout time and eternity will continue to be a reminder of the lengths you will go to to save your people. God, we are your people, the sheep of your pasture. May you lead this morning. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. You may have been faced with it on television, in a movie, or maybe in a song. And maybe you've just asked yourself this question because you've come to grips that, you know what, I'm on the other side of 50. There's other things on my mind besides Hawaii. What happens? What happens when I die? A famous American actress was interviewed, and she had this experience with a brain hemorrhage. When it hit me, I felt like I'd been shot in the head. That's the only way I can really describe it. It hit me so hard, it knocked me over on the sofa. I had a real, a real journey with this, with this that took me to places both here and beyond that affected me so profoundly that my life will never be the same. When death comes to you, as it will, it's a glorious and beautiful thing. This kind of giant vortex of white light came upon me, and I, and I kind of took off into a glorious, bright, 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 white light, and I started to see and be met by some of my friends. But it was very fast, and suddenly I was back. I was in my body. I was in my room. Jerry went in for, to the hospital for a routine surgery. While he was being operated on, he felt himself leave his body and float up to the ceiling. He could look back at everything that was taking place, look down on everything. And after a while, he felt himself being drawn into a tunnel, traveling at enormous speed. He finally arrived at the source of the light and wanted to stay wrapped in light forever. But he heard a voice say that it wasn't time yet, and suddenly he found himself back in his room at the hospital. There are books on near-death experiences, and they have catapulted to bestseller status. Seven million people cl have claimed to have had near-death experiences, and they all follow the same structure. Hollywood capitalizes on this. Many different organizations capitalize on this. There was a, a television show called Turning Point that would interview these people and ask them about their experiences of coming so close to death. There are some foundational facts that we need to establish concerning these experiences. First, none of the people who experienced near-death experiences really died. Well, of course they didn't, or else they wouldn't be able to come back and tell us this. No, no, that's not what this is saying. What this is saying is that there are two types of death that we go through. There's a clinical death, and there's brain dead. None of the people who went through either one of those died. They weren't ever declared clinically dead, and they weren't ever brain dead. In fact, we have technology today in which you can keep someone's heart pumping so technically they're still alive. We call it life support. 
The fact number two is that many near-death experiences resemble hallucinations. Now, this is an interesting one that maybe you hadn't realized or known before. There's a gentleman named Timothy Leary, a university professor, who advocated young people to take hallucinogenic drugs. In his experience, after eating certain Mexican mushrooms, thank you so much for the Mexican food gift card. I will tell you all about it. <laughs> I felt as if I pulled away and I saw myself eating nachos. Do not eat the Mexican mushrooms at Taco Bell. I'll hold the mushrooms, please. He experienced the same things. I'm sorry. After eating certain Mexican mushrooms, I realized that I had died, that I, Timothy Leary, the Timothy Leary game, had, was gone. I could look back and see my body in bed. So he hadn't died. He had just eaten these Mexican mushrooms. He had experienced the same thing, had the same recollections, the same separation and viewing back as somebody who claimed to have had a near-death experience. Aldous Huxley, he uh, is from The Doors Perception, page 52. It says, my body seemed to have disassociated itself completely from my mind. He had just taken this drug called mesalin. It was odd, of course, to feel that I, quote unquote, was not the same as these arms and legs that were out there. These experiences are explained because of these mental experiences that they're going through. So because I feel this way, because I assume I'm doing this, then that much must be the reality. Here is the difficult thing. What science tries to prove is what empirical evidence can prove. So what I can feel, touch, see, smell, taste, therefore I am. But just because I feel, what was that song, I think, REO Speedwagon or, or Boston, it's more than a feeling? Truth is, it's not based on any feeling, because sometimes our feelings can lead us in ways that aren't reality or aren't truth. Timothy Leary and Aldous Huxley were under the influence of drugs. In one experiment, one doctor, uh, Dr. Latilus Maduna, administered 30% carbon dioxide and 70% oxygen to a subject. Afterward, the subject stated, I felt as though I was looking down at myself, as though I was way out here in space. I felt sort of separated. And this is someone who had in, was induced by, into a medical experience of 30% uh, uh, was it oxygen and carbon dioxide? 30% carbon dioxide and 70% oxygen. So have you ever had a, a nightmare? Or let's, let me step back. Have you ever had a dream? that you woke up and you honestly thought it happened. I woke up one time and thought I had been fired as a pastor. I woke up one time weeping, crying, because I thought something happened to my family. I was in school one time and I was so tired that I had my head down and I felt like I was falling over. And so I just jerked my head up. <gasps> Oh, sometimes your brain can have you experience a dream or something in your mind that is so real that when you wake up, sometimes you don't even know what day it is. Sometimes I've gotten, gotten up and gotten ready for church. I remember one time my, my wife, I talk in my sleep sometimes, I was preaching a sermon because I thought I was up front. I asked people to turn to the book of John. I'm glad you can laugh at that. I may be asleep right now. <laughs> the third fact is that these out-of-body, near-death experiences contradict the Bible. Now, this is what we need to understand about the Bible. The Bible does not set out to be a science book, but it doesn't mean we can't trust when it delves into aspects of science. For instance, all of you are here in church today. But we're not talking about the science that got you here. We're not talking about how a car was made. And we are not, when I ask you, well, how did you get to dirt today? I drove my car. You're not going to tell me how the car works, because that's not your point. Your point is saying, I drove my car here. So you're dealing with aspects of things, but it's not setting out to prove that, because that's not the point. The point of the Bible is this. There's a sin problem, and God is doing everything he can to fix it and save us and come again. 
So while God deals with matters of science, it's not supposed to be a science book. But unfortunately, what some people do is they try to separate the Bible and science to where one's in a cave and the other one's in the 21st century. And that's not the case with this. In fact, we have to look at the Bible to deal with matters of life after death because that is what sin is all about. What happens when you die? And Jesus came down to deal with death. The Bible says in Job 7, verse 9, As a cloud vanishes and is gone, so he who goes down to the grave does not return. When you go to the grave, when you die, you do not return. You, we have to understand that. We have to believe that what, when, when Job, not only the author of Job, but the inspiration behind these words is true, and we can take that to the bank. He will never come to his house again. When I was in Kansas City, there was a woman who lived up north of Leavenworth. That's where the big old school uh, state uh, federal penitentiary is. They kept Michael Vick there. I didn't know if you realized that or not. But she was talking to her kids, her stepkids, mom, who had died. And that stepmom who was coming back was teaching her how to raise her kids. This is what you do for my kids. She did everything. Because she thought this was, she'd come back. Don't you tell my husband. But this is what I want you to do for my kids. So she did everything she said. And to try to tell somebody that what they've seen, because unfortunately, we base facts off of what we see. You're not always going to be able to trust your eyes. You're not always going to be able to trust your eyes. This Job says that once you die, you do not return. You don't come back to your house. Job 16, 22, When a few years are come, then I shall go the way whence I shall not return. Job knew that once I walk through death's door, I don't come back to this earth. So there's no passageway between the two. God does not stand as a bouncer, and you're trying to get into heaven, and God says, whoa, no, 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 not quite yet. Get back down into your body, because it's not time to come up through these gates yet. And so we have to walk all the way back down to our bodies and say, oh my goodness, not this time, maybe next time he'll let me through the gates. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Once you die, there is no coming back. There's not this, this highway or Interstate 83 that we're almost to Baltimore, but now I've got to go back to York now because I can't get to Baltimore. There's no in-between. Once you're there, you're there. You're never coming back to York. But then after we get to Baltimore, after we, and when we die, what's next is not a trip back to our bodies, it's a trip into, okay, what's next? What's next? Facts regarding near-death experiences. Many near-death experiences details are frightfully similar to what spiritualism teaches. I don't know how familiar, familiar you are with spiritualism. Many churches came out in opposition to Disney. I'll be honest with you. I don't like Disney. I don't like their movies. I don't like their cartoons. Because everything they push all got some kind of spiritualism in it. It teaches that there's some magic, mystical life after death or power that can bring things back. And a lot of Hollywood's pushing a lot of stuff like that on the, on the kids. Starts them out young. God, all, the devil always starts the kids out young on this stuff. But it's very similar to spiritualism, which is a pagan. It's pagan what spiritualism is. Spiritualism claims that the dead are not dead. J. Arthur Hill an author wrote, the fundamental principle of spiritism is that human beings survive bodily death. And that occasionally, under conditions not yet fully understood, we can communicate with those who have gone before. So under certain circumstances, we can communicate with people who are dead. So spiritualism says that when you die, you're not really dead. So we all show up for a funeral, but no dry, but no wet eyes, ladies and gentlemen. You still can talk to your loved one because they're not really dead. There's actually an immortal part that continues to live on after you die. And not only does it live on, but you can live with it and communicate with it. Just recently, well, I shouldn't say just recently, but in Obama's term, made jokes about Nancy Reagan's seances in the White House. Many people stood up for her. 
And he retreated from that comment. But there is this idea, there is this belief that I can still talk to people who have died, not just recently, but thousands of years ago as well. Spiritism claims the dead communicate with the living. So it's not just something I have to go to initiate. The dead can come and talk to me. Sir Oliver Lodge says, there is no death in the graveyard. I have frequent talks with the dead. I cannot doubt that people live after death, for I frequently talk with them. He is so confident in this. We have to understand something. The devil is able to do things. How many of you know the story of Elijah on top of Mount Carmel? I think that's 1 Kings, 2 Kings 17, or 1 Kings 17, I think it is. Do you realize those false prophets accepted the challenge of answering by fire? If, if, if Mike Tyson, even today, but if Mike Tyson in his prime challenges me in the ring, do you know what? I'm not accepting that challenge because I don't stand a chance. Here's the thing. They accepted it because they knew what their God was capable of. They knew their God can answer with fire. The issue was, God wasn't going to let them. They accepted because they knew their God. So talking to the dead, this guy has no doubts. He believes it because I talked to him. Now, we don't talk about that much. Nobody goes out and says, I talk to dead people. Because we think you're crazy. But yet, we'll watch it on movies. And we'll let our kids watch it in cartoons. So there's an element of craziness in reality, but we have no problem watching it on the screen as if it doesn't... Listen, what we take in through our eyes and ears affects us, who we are as people. So what happens when we die? And it is extremely important that each one of us understands not only what we believe, but what the Bible teaches on this subject. Because the Bible provides an extremely clear answer on this. We have to go back to the Garden of Eden when God created the heavens and the earth. He created life because before that, there was no life here. While, once he created Adam and Eve, he breathed into their nostrils the breath of life. Eve goes and has a conversation with the serpent. So he, she finds this tree of knowledge of good and evil, and she begins to have a conversation. In the course of conversation, the very first thing that the devil responds back with is, the devil says, you will not surely die. God says, in the day you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. The devil comes back and directly challenges and contradicts what God says and says, you will not surely die. You are not going to die if you eat this. In fact, God knows that when you eat this, you will be like God. So what's happening is, this is not a trip to the grave. This is a trip to enlightenment and a greater understanding, not only of yourself, but who you are and what you can be. And God doesn't want you to be. I want you to be. So the very first lie, and it is a lie, is that you will not die. Spiritualism says that the dead know more than the living. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. In this, as in many other Bible passages, the devil told the truth and the Lord was in error. So this spiritualist, the spiritualism guy, says that, listen, the devil told the truth. You don't really die when you die. You continue to live on. This is one of the areas where the devil was right and God was wrong. As other passages, which I'm sure they go into, and they talk about. But here's the thing that gets me. Is that it's one thing for this belief system to be tucked away in some pagan religion. It's another thing when the devil systematically links it with Christianity. The Bible says in John 8, 44, There is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. The, father of it. the devil lied to Adam and Eve, and the first lie is you will not surely die. And he continues to tell people throughout history that you will not die. In fact, it's when you disobey God that you're able to take the next evolutionary step in your process of becoming more enlightened and a better, greater creature. Disobey God. That's what takes you to the next step. Not obedience to God. 
Revelation 16, 14, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles. You'll hear of these people being abducted by aliens and who have marks on them. There's a meetings like this going on in New Jersey not too long ago when a, a missionary couple from Africa came and they shared this story of burying their little girl. She had accidentally eaten poison. And so they went to the funeral, they buried her. They go back to their house, and the mother goes up to her little girl's room. And she's looking out the window, and as she's looking out the window of her little girl's room, she sees her little girl walking towards the house. And the door's locked. Then she hears her little girl walking up the steps. She is still looking out the window. She hears her little girl walk into the room. She will not turn around because she knows she was just at the funeral. And the little girl comes up and puts her arms around her mother. She can feel her arms. And she says, Mommy, I'm okay. Everything's okay. And the mother knows that her little girl is in the grave and she will not see her until the resurrection. And so she says, in the name of Jesus, leave. And she disappears. There are other stories like that. But what the devil can do is he has this ability to impersonate lost loved ones. And what God says is, don't mess around with this. Don't go to mediums. Don't go to these seances. Don't go to this. Because it's not them. It's not good. It's other, it's, it's, it's the demons, it's the devil taking on that form and leading you astray. Because if you believe in life after death, if you believe that this is your dead loved one, the devil can feed you whatever he wants. Well, I talked to him. They told me what heaven was like. I talked to them. They told me this. These are real experiences people are having. This is not Hollywood. This is everyday life. But I think what the devil does is, is he dolens our senses with what we see on television so then when it happens in reality, we're that less likely to be abhorred by it. The Bible says in Genesis 2, verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. So God created Adam and Eve out of the dust. So if there's no spirit after, what, what happens then? What leaves the body? So if I die, what actually leaves? Okay, well, the, in the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, he formed them out of the dust of the ground. It goes on to say, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Did God put an immort, an, a soul into Adam? Did he call a spirit down and put him into Adam? No, what God did was he breathed into him, and so the dust plus breath becomes a living soul. We can look at it this way. Let's go back to first, second, third grade with a little bit of addition here. Dust plus the spirit equals a living soul. So dust plus the spirit equals a living soul. Here's another way of putting it. The elements of the earth plus breath equals a living creature. It's when you have this plus, if I have one plus zero, do I get two? If I have zero plus one, do I get two? No, I'm never getting two unless I put them together. I never get this result unless I put these two together. So then death is creation in reverse. So dust is formed and breath is breathed in. Life. But when life goes, the breath leaves and the body returns to dust. And that's death. So it's creation in reverse. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7 says, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. So there we said, hey, the Spirit. So we have the Spirit this, this out, this, that's separate. If this is the case, then no one is ever unconscious. You're never unconscious. You always know what's happening around you. So when the, when the doctor puts you under, if your spirit's immortal, you can't put a spirit to sleep then. If, if it can survive death, you think it can't survive some anesthesia or something like that? And so the dust returns to the ground, the spirit. There it is, the spirit. Okay. Well, we go to funerals. 
And what the Bible says is that when we go to these funerals, this body begins to decay and break back down to the substance from which it was taken. And many people get confused about this whole soul-spirit thing, and they think they're equal. Well, this is what the Bible does sometimes. Let's read this verse. All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. What happens is, is that what, the, what, Bible, what God does is he says one thing and then restates the very same thing in a different way to help us have an, a greater understanding of it. So he's not talking about two different things. He's saying the same thing, saying it two different ways to describe the same thing. So when a person dies, their body returns to dust, but their breath returns back to God. They cease to exist. Because before you're born, you do not, there's nothing about you that exists until you are conceived and come into this life. Same with death. You cease to exist at that point. The Bible says in Psalm 146, 3 and 4, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. So put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goes forth, he returneth to his earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. So what this is saying is, you can't put any real tangible trust or help in mankind. Why? Because once mankind dies, that's it. So I can only trust somebody up until a certain point. I can only go to President Obama as long as he's in office. But even he has a term limit. Then the next president comes in, I hope I'm on good terms with him. And while I'm, it's an office, the person only serves a certain term. Same with us. We have a certain term on this life. Once that's over, that's it. I don't go to heaven where I stand beside Jesus and then can advocate for you. No, there's nothing after that for me. And it says my thoughts cease to exist. So once my breath leaves, I no longer have these thoughts. No, the capacity of my mind to think. The Bible says that's it. Now, if we can communicate with the dead, if you continue to live, then you would think the Bible would tell us, yes, you still have your thoughts. You still cease to exist. You don't perish. You perish on the face of the earth, but you continue to walk unseen on the face of the earth as much as you want to present yourself to people around you. So the elements of the earth, plus or minus breath, equals a dead body. Let's look at it this way. Let's say you're building a block or box. So you get all of your materials together. You get your wood, you get your nails, you get your hammer, you get everything together. Do I have a box? No. Do I have the materials of a box? Yes. Okay, so then I go and I start driving the nails in, I'm hammering it, uh, and all of a sudden it starts taking shape, it starts taking form, and now I have a purpose for it. Now once I'm done putting everything together, do I have a box? Yes, yes I do have a box. But then let's say I take all of the nails out and I, I just disassemble it. Do I have a box? All I have are the materials. The materials. This is, let's oversimplify this because this is what God's done. Dust plus the breath of life gets me this. You go try breathing on some sand or dirt or dust and see what happens. Dust plus the breath of life. So is the power in the dust? No. Power's in God. The power is in God. The Bible talks about death being asleep. I love sleep. But I'm not staring at the clock when I'm asleep. I'm out. And the next day like that. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9.5, for the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. How much do the dead know? Nothing. So while the devil may try to get you to believe that the dead know more than the living, and so we go to the dead to find out about truth for this life and future events and what we should do, God says they're not, they're not alive. They're dead. They have nothing to offer. So really, when someone's talking to a dead person, they're not talking to that person. They're talking to a demon or the devil who takes on the form of that person to communicate with this person. And that is very scary, but very true and real. 
The Bible says in Psalm 115, 17, the dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into the silence. Now, some of you see, well, the wicked, yeah, I can understand how they don't know anything, but those of us who are saved by grace, when we die, we go to heaven, right? We live on immortality. Because isn't that the gift of life that we take on, this mortal flesh takes on immortality? Well, here's what the Bible says. Not even, we don't even praise God. Do you realize what I'm going to be doing when I get to heaven? I'm going to be praising God. I'm going to be, you're not going to be able to shut me up because I'm in heaven. Un, unbelievable. You are going to get tired of listening to Morgan Kochenauer when we get to heaven. All the angels are going to sit there and say, unbelievable. Can we please shut these humans up? They can't stop praising God because they, they're in heaven. No, they're not going to say that. And God's not going to tell us that if we really go to heaven when we die, that you're not going to praise God. Hey, zip it, zip, zip. Quiet. This isn't a library of eternity. It's heaven. But what God says is, you don't go to heaven when you die. You go to sleep. So any of us who have lost a loved one, and we'll talk about how beautiful this truth is. But when you've lost a loved one, do you know where they're not? They're not burning in hell. Do you realize how many funerals people go to and try to find the good things in the person? Gang members. Wrong side of the tracks. Horrible people. Can you imagine if we go to a court hearing and the verdict is read and one person stands up in the whole courtroom and says, burn them alive. That's not the God we serve. It's not that our loved ones go to heaven and they're watching everything, but yet they're not allowed to interact with humanity. So we have to watch Watch our loved ones go through the pain. Don't cross the road. Look the other way. Don't walk into that building. Don't go with that man. We rest and we sleep. The Bible says in Psalm 6, 5, For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give thanks? Each one of us has much to give thanks for. And when we get to heaven, we'll be thanking till we're blue in the face if that ever happens. Ezekiel 18, 4 says, A soul that sinneth, it shall die. So death comes to us all, no matter what life decisions we have made. The only difference is, is that, like we read in Hebrews, once death comes, then judgment. We all talked about when the judgment takes place. We're living in a judgment hour now where cases are being decided, where we are making decisions for Jesus or not for Jesus. So we will look at two different aspects here. There is mortal and there is immortal. Human beings are mortal. And when you look at Job 4, 17, and you can write these verses down, we won't get into them. Romans 6, 12, Romans 8, 11, and 2 Corinthians 4, 11. Mortal means subject to death. Immortal means you are not subject to death. So then it says human beings seek immortality and will receive it only at the second coming of Christ. We read this one in Romans chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, and 1 Corinthians 15, verses 53 and 54. I would encourage you to look at the 1 Corinthians 15 chapter. That's a really good chapter on the second coming. Death, in the King James Bible, is uses the word soul 1,600 times, but never once uses the term immortal soul. Only God is immortal. That is not something that we have in and of ourselves separate from God. Just like when Adam and Eve had the tree of life. Why would they need a tree of life if they have an immortal soul? They have life. You don't need to eat from this tree. So it's not something that God put inside of us. It, life is always connected to our relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible declares 53 times that death is asleep. There are many African religions that believe that you, you do not die when you go to the funeral, you go into the grave. And that's why there's a lot of ancestral uh, worship. But then also in the Christian church, there's a belief in life after death. That's why we have these saints that we continue to worship. And we continue to lift up. I know of one person who was dividing up their inheritance. Wasn't the greatest. They didn't use the spirit. 
of the, the letter. But what held them to this was the belief that they were watching down on them. And that it was going to be bad karma if they didn't do this. I'm not saying you don't go through on people's wills. It is their last will and testament. But this belief that if I don't do something the right way, well, that's pagan. That's a pagan theology. It's also a pagan theology when people view God as looking to, to punish you if you don't do something the right way. So then how did this creep into the church? William E. Gladstone, a historian, says, the pagan doctrine of the immortality of the human soul crept into the, to the back door of the church. Back in Egypt, there's a, uh, a column, a Babylonian column, I'm sorry, Babylon, where ancestor worship is based on the false doctrine of the immortality of the soul. So this isn't new to Christianity. It crept into Christianity, but it's not new to the world. The Babylonians believed this. The Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, believed in the pagan doctrine of the immortality of the soul. This is an Egyptian physician preparing a pharaoh for death. He believed in the Ba and Ka, the immortal parts of the human. So they were preparing them for life after death. And a lot of these people who uh, maybe kill themselves in the name of their God or, or blow things up in the name of their God believe immortality is waiting for them with a planet filled with whatever. So really, this is momentary to the eternal bliss I will have on my new realm and harem. So even these beliefs were back during Egyptian and Babylonian times. Ancient pagan Romans believed in the immortal soul. So this is something that was during the Roman times. And Satanists believe in the pagan doctrine of the immortality of the soul. That is something that is, I don't know if you realize this, but Satanists are really starting to creep into the public domain and, and doing a lot of things. I can't remember where it was, but they want to have a, a display for Christmas. Uh, I can't remember what town hall it is. But they want to put a display up for Christmas. They did Harvard. They wanted to have a, a satanic worship in one of the basements uh, over in Harvard. Do you know Harvard started off as a, a ministry school? Master, you got your Master of Divinity from Harvard? I don't know if it's necessarily turning out preachers today, but that's at least what it started out as. But the Bible says that the soul is not immortal. The Old Testament Bible's writers use the phrase slept or rested with his fathers as an expression of death. In John chapter 11, 11, Jesus is presented with an urgent plea to come because Lazarus, Lazarus is sick and he's going to die. But Jesus does not come right away. There's some people right now where they're waiting for Jesus to come, but maybe Jesus isn't coming right away. And so then we kind of turn on Jesus, and Mary and Martha kind of had a passive-aggressive reaction to Jesus, but we blame him. But all the while, Jesus wanted to use us for the glory of God. And he says, our friend Lazarus is sleeping. Now, if someone tells you that, hey, listen, this person just got run over by a dump truck, and they're about to die, they're just going to sleep. They just got run over by a dump truck. What Jesus is doing is comparing what they take as death with what he considers to be sleep. You see, this first death that everybody dies, whether I go out and get hit by a car and I die, or my grandfather or your loved one, that's called a sleep. God considers that a sleep because that he can bring you back from. Why? Because he's God. There's another death we need to talk about, though, and we'll talk about that one later. But this is a sleep. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, he sleeps, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. One of his disciples says, Lord, if he sleeps, he will, he will get well. How be it, Jesus spake of his death, but they thought he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. So they got really confused with what Jesus was saying here. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. This is how I view it, but let me speak to you as, so that you can understand this. I believe he's asleep. He's asleep. For your sake, he's dead. Okay? That way we're not having this, uh, this, this uh, confusion. So when Jesus did show up, Mary and Martha were extremely disappointed because he didn't get there in time to save him, and now he's dead, and now they don't think there's any way he's going to be able to come back. Martha says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you only would have been here, you could have saved him from death. This is what Jesus is trying to do, not just with Martha and Mary and helping their family out, but what he wants to show 
to all of us about death. Thy brother will rise again. And Martha knew, yes, I know my brother's going to rise again at the resurrection of the last day. So Martha believed in the resurrection of the dead at the second coming, at the end of everything. And that's how all of them believed at that time, that the resurrection, everybody would be raised up at the end. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But the Lord, by this time, because he went to the grave, take me to the grave, because he's going to raise the dead. He's going to raise them up. So they go to the, to the grave where Lazarus is. It's been four days. Now, four days, I take my dog out to use the bathroom. You know what I smelled out there just this past week? A dead animal. Those things reek. They are nasty. And I don't know where it was coming from. And so they are very well aware of how this is going to smell when they roll that stone away. And they're wondering, is this guy out of his mind? Why would we do that? This guy stinks. He's been dead for four days. It's not like his body's still warm. His body is decaying. It's breaking down. To which Jesus, but Lord, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. But the Lord, it, wasn't, it didn't matter how many days he was in the grave. It could have been four days. It could have been 400 years. The same way he spoke at creation, he speaks to Lazarus and says, come forth. And that flesh is made new again. And the breath of life goes back into him. And he comes walking out of the grave. Now when Lazarus came, he didn't say, Lazarus, come down, because Lazarus is not in heaven. He says, come forth, because he's in the tomb. Come here. Not come down, come. And when Lazarus comes out, he doesn't go tell everybody, I hate Jesus. I was in heaven. He doesn't say, I love Jesus. I was burning in hell. He doesn't say, I was in heaven. Here I was, talking it up with, with David. I was talking to Moses. I was talking to Gabriel. We were on our way to the furthest points of the universe when all of a sudden I heard my name. Do you know how many times kids respond to their name? Zero. And this would be one time where I would not want to hear my name. I do not. You mean to tell me you're bringing me back down here? I don't want to be on earth. I'm in heaven. If I'm in Hawaii, why is my boss calling me? I'm on vacation. I'm in heaven. Don't call. No, 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 no. Take Moses. Don't take me. Enoch's right over there. Don't take me. He wasn't in heaven. The, Jesus, the reason Jesus waited is because he wanted us to know that he has power over the grave and he has power to give. He is the life giver. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. The Lord himself will descend out of the heavens. And with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will be raised. If I'm in heaven, why do I need to be raised up? I'm in heaven. And it's not like there's this spirit form of me in heaven. Now I've got to come back down and put on my earthly body so I can go... No. The dead in Christ will be raised up. And they'll go up first. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. With who? With the dead in Christ that have been raised up. We'll be raised up and caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So the second coming is a time when all the dead in Christ, all those who have given their life to Jesus and have died in the past and who are alive at the time of the second coming will be joined up together and will go meet Jesus together. It won't be one before the other. There won't be a second place. We'll all go together with our families being reunited. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Hey, man, I'm so glad you joined us. We've been up here for like a thousand years. So nice. Now we can come back so you guys can come too. No, we'll all go up together. So the Bible talks about death being asleep. And how long do we sleep? How long do you sleep? Some of us wish we got more sleep than others. I don't know how much sleep you got last night. I remember one time I fell asleep. I was reading my Bible downstairs. Usually what happens, if it's after 10 o'clock and I tell my wife I'm going to stay downstairs and read my Bible more, she knows this is what's going to happen. She's going to have to come down an hour later because I will have fallen asleep on the couch. 
And that's what happens every single time. She has to come down. Morgan, wake up. And for me, I'm like, wake up. I wasn't sleeping. Yes. How long was I sleeping for? For two hours. No way. Yes. Because you have no consciousness of time. You have no concept of how fast time is moving when you sleep. So it's a blink of an eye. So while you close your eyes in death, a split blink of an eye later, you're opening your eyes to the second coming of Jesus Christ. What about the thief on the cross? I don't know if you've heard the story of the thief on the cross. Next to Jesus, he, he asked Jesus, as I would hope all of us are asking Jesus, let me read this first. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. So we know this. We know that the Bible teaches this. So when, and then it goes on to say, the dead will not praise the Lord. So as a thief is on the cross, next to Jesus, could you imagine being crucified next to Jesus? Would you ever think that God would be next to you on an execution block? That'd probably be the last place you'd think you'd find Jesus, is in the death chamber. He says to him, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Do you want God to remember you? I want God to have me on his mind. I want God to have all of us. I want God to have this church on his mind. I want God to have fond memories of me. And fond memories of all of us. So for me too, just like the thief on the cross, please, remember me too, Lord. Just like you remember the thief, remember me too. And the Jesus replied, Assuredly, I say to you that you will be with me in paradise. Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And a lot of people have taken this to mean that he's telling the thief, Assuredly, I say to you that today you will be with me in paradise. Now, this is something we have to understand. And this is actually really important. You may think it's not that big of a deal, but this is a very big deal. The Bible was not written with punctuation. Well, what's the big deal about punctuation? Do you realize how many misunderstandings there are? Do you realize I do not want to communicate via text or email because people can't see me when I'm talking to them? So they can misunderstand things or make assumptions because they can't see body language? If body language is important, don't you think punctuation would be important too? Where you place the comma can have ramifications in a legal brief in a, in a contract so punctuation is extremely important but they did not put punctuation Paul when he wrote out his letters did not use commas, periods, whatever but for us, it marks off sentences and thoughts and prepares the next thought. And we're able to separate things so that this is in this context and this idea is here. But the Bible was never written that way. It wasn't until they translated the Bible into understandable languages of their contemporary times that they begin to add in punctuation. Because punctuation in their time, cutting edge stuff. So you had this whole process done painstakingly. And so what would happen is they would look at an idea and they would measure it against what they believed. So they believed you go to heaven when you die. Comma. It should actually read this way. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today. Today I'm telling you. Never forget what I'm going to say to you today. You will be with me in paradise. Now this is the only thing that we were hanging our hat on I could understand some skepticism. But this is what we need to understand. Jesus did not ascend to heaven on the day that he died on the cross. That is very fundamental. He didn't go to heaven when he died on the cross. He went to the tomb. And so on Good Friday, they went over and they were going to break the legs so that they couldn't escape, but then also it would speed up the process of death because they didn't want him hanging over Passover. They didn't want them hanging on Sabbath as people are going to church. How gracious of them. But when they got to Jesus, they realized he was already dead. That's why they put the spear into his side and that water and blood came out unmixed. He was already dead. That's why Pilate was so surprised when he found out that Jesus died. Are you serious? He's already dead? Because this is a process that could take weeks to play out. But they were trying to speed up the process. 
Jesus did not ascend to heaven when he died. When, Mar when Mary came to the tomb to try to find Jesus, Jesus was there. She thought it was the gardener, but then realizes it's Jesus. And when she does, Jesus said unto her, Do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Don't touch me, because I haven't gone to heaven yet. So it's a lie, if we believe this, for Jesus to tell the thief upon the cross, you'll be with me today in paradise, when Jesus wouldn't have even been there in the first place. He can't say that because he's not there himself. He's not even going there yet because he's been in the grave and he hasn't even been resurrected yet. But now he's been resurrected. He said, don't touch me. I haven't gone to the Father yet. And saying, sorry, I didn't finish it. For I have not yet ascended to, the, to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto the, my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. So go tell them that I'm going to ascend to heaven. I am going to heaven. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ brought with him. And at the time of the death, there was a resurrection of sorts. But that also bears resemblance to the first fruit offering. And so Jesus Christ ascends to heaven with all of the fruits, not all of the fruits, but some of the fruits, saying, listen, this is just a taste, an appetizer of what's to come when a second coming takes place and the great resurrection takes place. You see, Jesus Christ promised the thief on the cross that day that he would have salvation. Not that he was going to heaven right then, because even the thief hadn't died yet. It's that when it comes time, I will remember you, and you will be in heaven with me in that great and glorious day. Revelation 1.18 says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. So even Jesus says, I was alive, I was dead, I was in the grave, and behold, now I'm alive again. I was resurrected. I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of death and of Hades and of death. Jesus has the keys, brothers and sisters. And this is something that is far greater than any lottery we'll be able, ever be able to win. Our, G, our Jesus has an unlimited bank account of life for all of us that can't be tapped out. All who come to him, there's not a quota, there's not a cap on what Jesus, who Jesus can save and who Jesus can give life to. He wants to give life to everybody. He is life. It's like he's electricity. He can run and power everything. And he wants to give each one of you power. He wants to give all of us the power that we need. In the catacombs of Rome, there's inscriptions that are written on the tombstones. On the pagan tombstones, it's written, goodbye for all of eternity. Goodbye forever. On the Christian's tombstones, goodbye until we meet again. Goodbye until the morning. Even in death, we don't need to fear because our, our lives are hid with Christ on high and he will raise us up on that last day. Can you imagine? I went to, a, when I went to school down in Chattanooga, Tennessee, there was a, a graveyard that my, my grandfather's buried in and I would always jog up around this loop and every once in a while I'd just stop in there and, and just uh, pray that I had half the spirit he had. Please give me at least half. I'm not asking for a double portion. I'm just asking for a half of what this guy had. And uh, there was a little tomb over there. There was a little baby. It's a tiny little tombstone, just a short spot. When I look at my kids, <laughs> when I see them cry, I don't care if they're dead wrong. I don't want them to cry. It brings me pain. And there's, different, there's that whiny cry, but then there is that just cry when they're broken down because their toy broke or the, 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 the animal ran away or the squirrel won't come over and they just cry. And their lips, you can just tell this is not normal. This is, this is a little bit extra. And you want to do everything you can and my heart breaks. Every time I hear of something happening to someone else's child, my heart breaks breaks because I think of what I would be going through if that was my child. The innocence, the sweetness, the purity of these children, the youthfulness, the happiness, the joy. And then to see a tombstone with a date here and maybe a month or two later, a date here. And we all know that it's not right. I don't care what the date is on either end. 
It's not right. And God recognizes that, and God came and he did something about that so that one day those babies will be presented anew to their families. Can you imagine parents wrapping their arms around family again, knowing that they will never lose them or be without them ever again for eternity? For each one of us, Jesus Christ wants us to know that he has overcome the grave. But don't be fooled by what's happening around us. There are people, there are denominations and Christians that believe that when you die, you go to heaven or you burn in hell. And so mothers, in fearful trepidation, wonder if their child is burning in hell. They always remember everything that was great about their child. Surely the Lord will take him to heaven. Surely he's not. We don't mind Hitler. We don't mind Jeffrey Dahmer. We don't mind some of these other heinous criminals. The BTK killer. We don't mind these guys burning in hell. But when it's our little baby, no, no. They go to heaven. And it's people try to provide comfort that they're in a better place now. But all that does is set things up for the devil to come in and clean people's theological clock to where they'll accept anything. And now you have a little boy saying, heaven is for real. I saw your father. Was that your grandfather? Yeah, I talked to him. And people are flocking, flocking. Did you see my relative in heaven? Yeah, they told me all about heaven. It was an amazing place. There are going to be people believe in aliens. Why? Because they believe they've been experimented on. It is so real to them. The Bible says there are only two people, two entities that come in contact with us on this earth. Agents of heaven and agents of hell. There are no aliens that come to this planet. They're only in the form of demons. Or demons only come in the form of these aliens. But there is no dead relatives coming back to talk to us. So next time you're talking with someone, the greatest assurance we can have is no, they're not burning for eternity right now. They're asleep. And no, they're not watching your every move or illegal transactions you're doing right now. They're asleep. They're asleep. And one day we're going to be resurrected. And that's when our reward comes, is at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And what a reward that day will be, when all the dead in Christ will be raised. We're going to talk a little bit about this, uh, more about this tonight. But when the dead in Christ are raised, oh, brothers and sisters, what a glorious day that will be. I want to wish each and every one of you a happy Sabbath. I pray for God's richest blessings upon you. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for your goodness and your kindness and your grace. Father in heaven, so many times we can try to provide comfort and peace. And we think we're saying something that can be helpful, but not realizing, not realizing what could happen as a result of our words. Lord, there are many loved ones that we have lost in the past whether it's been a baby, whether it's been a miscarriage, whether it's been a child, a toddler, a teenager, a young man or woman, a husband, a wife, a parent, we have all had to endure this loss. But Lord, knowing that each one of our loved ones is not in one of two places, but is sleeping until Jesus comes, a moment an instant, a blink, of an, a blink of an eye, while it may be 30, 40, 50, 200 years before you come, for them who pass away, it is but a split second of time before they open their eyes back up and realize they're staring at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Lord, may we all take comfort in the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. And may all, we all take comfort in knowing 
that we'll be reunited with our loved ones. Thank you so much for Jesus. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.